Madnin! Madnin! Welcome to the India Explained podcast, recorded in London and San Francisco. One take, unscripted, no rehearsal. Good morning, Bunty. Greetings from San Francisco this excellent July day. How are you? I'm super, Rohit. I'm super. I am uh, feeling particularly nice because I had some great sushi and watched a lovely play. Um, so yeah, everything's good. Uh, so what are we going to talk about today, Rohit? Well, I had a question. You mentioned you had sushi and uh, that connects to what we'll talk about. Now in Britain, you have this thing called VAT, right? Value added tax. So That's correct. I've never understood what value added tax is. Uh, or I had some understanding of it. And uh, in India now, I don't know if we have VAT or not. I sometimes recall seeing it on, uh, you know, some receipts. Uh, I know that if you're a foreign national or not a resident of India, it doesn't apply, perhaps. I might be wrong about this. But the big event in India was the rollout of the GST, the goods and services tax, which theoretically turns India into a single market as far as tax is concerned. Instead of, you know, all our states having their own tax laws, rates, octroi tolls, etc. The idea is that you have a single market. Now, long story short, this was initiated by the Congress. It's been implemented finally by the BJP, but critics A say it was done very hastily. B, they say it's not really a single market uh, because it actually creates five different taxation levels and it has all kinds of absurd consequences. Uh, I was uh, told by my uh, father-in-law uh, that, uh, you know, one of the consequences will be that smaller cars become more expensive and larger cars become cheaper and so on. And then there was a lot of drama in the rollout where following Nehru, Modi launched this at midnight. He also gave some kind of bizarre speech to an association of chartered accountants and walked off to uh, a theme from Star Wars. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the manner of Darth Vader and uh, Modi's fans have gone wild. Uh, you know, Tarun Vijay was a BJP guy. RSS BJP guy has, uh, is saying that it's, you know, it's a historic moment and so on and so forth. So that's kind of the quick and dirty uh, of it. Now, how it will pan out remains to be seen. Well, I, I think with all of these kind of tax changes, I think the one key thing in all of this has to be in any tax uh, law, is only as efficient as the implementation, right? Right. So the natural question to this would be, you've made a new law. In theory, it's great. In practice, how will it translate, right? And um, I don't know, I'm not in the habit of quoting The Economist, but uh, because, you know, that publication has its own little uh, skews and, and, and kind of uh, problems. But they, it, one of the latest Economist uh, publications is reading it on the way to work. They did a big piece on Modi and his work in India. And what it w- that publication was signaling that quite a lot of Modi's uh, policies are a lot of fanfare, but falling down on execution. So he's a guy who's full of hawa. So he's constantly saying stuff that I'm doing this, doing that, doing this. And when you scratch under the surface, you realize that not much has happened. We've spoken about this. Uh, when, you know, remember we talked about an episode around, you know, uh, Swachh Bharat, where, you know, toilet money was being bamboozled, toilets were being stolen. Right, we right. We did it about a 10. Few. So the, the, the principle is the same. You know, some grand announcement followed by a lot of press uh, and uh, hot air and then faltering in execution. Now, you know, if you take a benign view, you can say at least this guy is rocking stuff up, you know, shaking the system. But I think history will only tell us whether things like demonetization or GST are going to be successful because the jury that is out and people can say that it's a biased jury, it's not a, um, it's not something sensible, have already started taking shots at what did you get out of doing demonetization, right? right? Who were the benefic- beneficiaries of demonetization, right? Similarly, on GST, my question, I go back to my initial point, which is you've Put it out in theory. Do you have the infrastructure to put it out in practice? Or are we going to see snaking queues of people filing tax returns? The one thing I've picked up, Rohit, is it makes life very onerous for businesses because you have to apparently report three times a month and 10 times a It's like a very onerous reporting mechanism on GST. Now, maybe that is replacing the hajar other types of reporting that they have to do on very many different taxes. I do not know. I'm not an expert. But in theory... The fact that you, if a truck passes from Urissa, Bihar, West Bengal to Bihar, uh, back to Bihar and then to UP, somewhere, it has to pay different types of, the goods have to pay 
taxes in three, four separate regimes. If that is being absorbed in principle, it's a brilliant idea. And if it works, great. Uh, you know, I'm I'm hoping that it'll free up the business. But like so many of these governments' discussions, whether it's like bullet trains, uh, money uh, demonetization, Swaj Bharat, and now GST, uh, uh, you know, the jury is out. So let's give it a fair uh, hearing. Let's see what happens. But uh, it it'll all be in the execution. That's my view on this. Right now, I had um, you know, you raise a ton of I think very relevant questions. Uh, demonetization, I would say that it seems it hasn't been very successful economically uh, in terms of its impact on the economy or any of the professed goals. But then the underlying question is, what is success for Modi? Uh, and here, I think, uh, the, you know, the same principle can actually apply to the GST as well. So what Modi got out of demonetization is essentially the UP election. And somehow he managed to persuade uh, people who might be in you know, the lower middle income, lower income strata that painful as it was for them, it was even more painful for people at the top. And I think the psychology of, uh, uh, you know, people who supported it, their idea was that, look, we have to undergo inconvenience anyways. We've undergone a little extra inconvenience, but for the first time, Modi at least has inconvenienced the rich. Uh, play this against the backdrop of, uh, you know, the, the narrative of a corrupt, decadent uh, Congress, which uh, was utilized to great effect by, you know, those people's movements in which the BJP RSS also had a hand, and you have a sure shot winner. So I think as far as the perpetuation of Modi in power is concerned, uh, he will, you know, uh, he will get some benefit. I think that's the sort of calculation made there. And uh, connecting to your point about the economist saying that he's uh, a lot of talk and no do, that's exactly what he wants. He's very good at essentially claiming credit for things that others have done and persuading uh, the people that he is a man of action, as you said. So I think to a great extent, this is about uh, signaling. To a great extent, this is about you know making the point that he's an assertive leader uh, in contrast to Manmohan Singh and so on. Uh, now, uh, as far as his vision for India, it's interesting, Ram Guha makes a point that he said, you know, you may disagree with Modi's vision, but he has some vision for India. And I think that's a fair point. And the only thing, of course, is that the vision is itself, uh, you, you know, I think the economics and the uh, are, are always subordinate to the politics, really. He has this idea of a powerful Hindu state along the lines of Singapore and so on. Uh, and everything he does kind of points towards centralization. Uh, and by that, I don't mean GST, but I just mean in general centralization of power. Uh, so those would be my, you know, somewhat scattered thoughts on this on this issue. But uh, finally, I'll just say from you know my point of view that uh, hopefully it does reduce corruption a bit. Uh, we Indians have a talent for you know figuring out ways to be corrupt, no matter what system is in place. But uh, you know maybe this, in as much as it will create its own red tape, but on net cut down red trip. Hopefully, that's a good thing. Oh, and the uh, the just on on the slipstream of what you just said. I have heard about GST from some of my friends in India, and that all of that involved buying white goods before the GST kicked in. Right. Right. Now these were like oh, people buying laptops and fridges and washing machines. Right. So uh, before the GST regime kicked in. Now I'm thinking that's one transaction. Surely there is some guy. Who's going to do this? Because you know, to to have a regime of taxes create opportunities for the corrupt is very easy. Because all a guy has to do is lay out enough credit to buy 45 washing machines, and then he'll buy it at 20% less, and then flog it at you know, always more and make a make a right. killing. So I hope those kind of things don't happen. But you know, as as we've discussed, let's wait and watch. But uh, yeah, I hope it's not all hot air, and there is uh, some substance behind this. Okay, excellent. All right. So on that note, Bunty, let's wrap this up and uh, we'll be back with another episode very soon. All right. Take care, man. Shalom. Take care. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.